So in this video sequence, I'll be going over the trading strategy design methodology that I use. We'll be looking at different types of algorithms. Uh, we'll be looking at a trading algorithm example, and then I'll go through the algo design methodology that I use at algorithmic trading. Okay, feel free to pause this video. I'm gonna try to go through this slide real quick. So remember, trading features is not for everyone. There's substantial risk of loss involved. My company, nor I, am a CTA. We're a third party developer, which means there's no advice given. All signals are given to everyone and they don't distinguish between uh, different people. This is a letter of direction business, so you have full control over your account. And with that, I'll go ahead and get started. Before I jump into this topic, I really want to just distinguish between two terms that I'll use pretty often. One is a, a trading algorithm and the other is a trading system. So a trading algorithm would be a step-by-step -step set of rules defining an individual strategy. And then a trading system would be a collection of these trading algorithms used together in order to diversify and maximize gains. And I try to characterize that with this graphic here, where you have three trading algorithms. You have a momentum A, which might be a day trade. You have a mean reversion algorithm A, and then a momentum B, which might be a swing trade. And notice you could have, a, a, you could have any number of these different algorithms within any given system, but all of these combined would represent a system. So let me quickly define what I mean by a momentum algorithm though. This, this would be an algorithm that attempts to determine the direction of the trend and then places a trade in that same direction, either long or short. So you could have a long momentum or a short momentum. And it could trade the S&P or it could trade the 10 year or it could trade gold or, or whatever uh, asset you want to trade. A mean reversion algorithm is more of a, a contrarian algo. It's, it's one that would trade contrary to the trend with an expectation that the trend will revert back to some more common trading level. So it's, it's reverting back to the mean. Now, of course, there's other algos too. You have uh, breakout algos, there's day trade algos, there's swing trade algos. These are very broad categories that I'm, I'm using uh, for a specific purpose, which will become clear in some of the other videos that I do when I talk about the methodology I use to assemble a trading system. Now for some of you, I realize that you might not be super familiar with the, the concept of a trading algorithm. So I just wanted to show this chart to give you an example of a real basic algorithm. And, and this is, uh, just so you know, the code on the screen here does not correlate to this algo that you see on it, nor does the strategy report. I'm really just showing it so that you can conceptually see what I mean by a trading algorithm. But first off, a trading algorithm, in essence, what it is, again, it's a step-by-step -step set of instructions. So it's something that, um, and technically, you, you could have an algo that's, that's not coded. It would just be an algo that you've defined and that you follow. And most traders that are technical use some kind of algo, even if they don't code it. Now, usually when people refer to trading algorithms, though, they really refer to some automated trading algo that is coded and that is running on some platform like TradeStation, NinjaTrader, or, or some other platform, Multicharts. But really the way it starts, it starts with an idea, and the idea is coded. It's applied to a chart, and so the chart can, can be any, any symbol or any, uh, any interval. It could be a tick chart. It could be really any kind of chart that you can think of. And the algorithm is applied to it, and, and usually what they'll do, I'm showing TradeStation here, but usually they'll apply the trades that are in the code to the chart. And so what it's doing is just showing you, had the algorithm traded live, uh, these are the trades it would have made. But just remember, the, it's, it's anytime you see trades on a chart like this, normally you should assume that they're gonna be from a SIM account and that they're not necessarily live trades. Now, TradeStation, if you're trading live, then they will actually show the live trades as well, kind of overlaid on top of, of these trades. And you can obviously you know, turn them off or on so that you see only the live or the simulated. But really, the, the point of, of me showing this is that on the chart, once you apply the code to it, it'll show you all the trades that would have been placed. And then, of course, you can look at a performance report that would show for the time sequence on the chart, uh, going, whether that's going back to 2001 or a, a 30 days uh, prior, it's going to show what the results of that trading system would have been. I don't want to go into all the details of the, the performance reports because it really is correlating to a back-tested data set, and those are always going to be the most optimistic or you could say least reliable. So I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the performance reports. Just know that 
that there's all kinds of ways that the trades get analyzed. So profit factor, you can look at drawdown, average winning trade, average losing trade, just all kinds of data, really as much data as you want to see. And of course, it'll show you the, the trade lists, the equity curve, and all those things. So that was really just a big introduction into what a trading algorithm is. Now what I want to do is talk about the methodology that I use when I design an individual trading algorithm. So remember, this is an, an individual algo, not a system necessarily. Although the result of this design would then go into a trading system. Okay, so think of it as each algorithm that's being designed. And in the example I had, I had a momentum A, momentum B, and then a mean reversion A. We'll go through these stages. And this sequence usually begins with some kind of an idea, and that's step number one, that exists in your mind and that you've maybe seen on a chart or that you just want to test out and see how, how it looks. The next thing you'll do typically would be code it. Um, and, and by the way, I, I feel like it's probably good for me to mention that with what my company does, this, this section is really an educational section so that people know how I design my algos. And also, if there's any developers out there uh, that might not be aware of some of these terms or, or this way of designing an algorithm, they might be able to, to maybe learn something from this video. So it's also intended to be educational. Um, but we, I start with an idea, and then I'll code it. And you, when you code an algo, it's, it's going to have typically some inputs, some, uh, some, uh, some inputs, some variables, various uh, components for entry logic, uh, technical indicators possibly, and then also some kind of exit logic. After, after that's defined and the algorithm is coded, then I'll usually do the initial analysis where I'll apply the algorithm to the chart and do an initial analysis to see if the design has potential. And if it does, then it progresses to, to step four, which would be the back test. So, and, and by the way, if the algo doesn't make it past step three, usually it's just discarded and, and it's, okay, well, I looked at that idea and it's, it just doesn't look that good. So I'm gonna skip, I'm not gonna just spend any more time on it. But assuming it, it looks decent or, um, or possibly it doesn't look good in step three, but, but I, I notice one other thing I might do to change it. Then I might go back to step one, back to two, back to three. So I might loop on that maybe twice, but any more than that, usually I'll, I'll, I'll just discard it because uh, I, I, don't like, um, I don't like spending too much time on an idea that doesn't seem to be worth the time. Because what that can do is just set you up for, for over-optimizing the design potentially and, and having a, an algo that doesn't work uh, uh, once, once it goes live. Okay, so the next step though, assuming I get through step three and the equity curve looks halfway decent, in other words, it's trending higher, then I'll do the back test. Now the back test, I'll always go back as far back as I can. The reports will be analyzed, including uh, average gain per trade, drawdown, profit factor. Uh, and and I'll, I'll always remember that the back test should be viewed with uh, the most skepticism because it is, it is a very optimistic view of what an algorithm's potential is. But it is helpful, and it's helpful for a lot of different reasons. Um, w one way in particular it's helpful, just in case I forget to mention later, is that once you trade live, it gives you an idea of what you might expect. So if you have five losing trades in a row, you might, if you don't have any kind of back test, you might bail on the idea altogether, thinking, well, five losers in a row, that, that's not good. But what if in the back test, you do have uh, several cases where you have five losing trades in a row and maybe even more maybe you have 10 losing trades in a row and and so otherwise this is a great algorithm except for the five losses you just took you you might uh, it, it helps you stay in an algorithm even if it's not doing well initially because as as you're probably aware it it really is a numbers game you, especially with with quantitative trading um, there's going to be winning trades and losing trades and, and you, you're going to be looking at the average of, of all of them over a, a period of time. All right, so, so when you do the optimization, really what you're doing is you're trying to loop through to find the best input for the algorithm. So if, if you're using a stop market, then the stop market might be an input into the algorithm. And, 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 and I would do something of an optimization where I might start with a $200 stop and loop through all the way up to $1,000 and see which stop it picks on $200 increments. So it'll analyze with the $200 stop, 
four hundred dollars stop, six hundred, et cetera, until it gets to a thousand, and then it'll stop. And it'll tell you what what stop was the most optimal for the back test. Once all the optimization is done, and that can take actually quite a while, you, you could actually run optimizations because the data set grows exponentially. Uh, you can actually run an optimization that might last a month. Now, I wouldn't recommend you do that if you're a developer listening. Um, obviously, that that's, takes way too long, and you're probably crunching so many numbers that it's going to be over-optimized anyway. So I like to do things on a pretty, uh, pretty broad level. So instead of, of doing a stop of $100 and then checking every $12.50, like one tick on the S&P, I'll do it on more kind of $200 increments. And the reason why is because it's going to be more of a reliable algo that um, generally speaking, in other words, you're, you're not, um, we're not looking for the most optimal stop based on the back test. We're, yes, we are looking for that, but we're only doing it so that we can find the most optimal stop going forward. And whether and and there's always going to be margin for error. So a tick or two on the S and P is not going to make a huge difference in the long run when you look at a thousand trades. Um, so yeah, so that's the optimization. But once you get through that, then the final step, usually before I go live, is some kind of a walk forward analysis. And what that does is it'll it'll look at the algo in an in sample data period, and it'll and what it'll do is it'll walk forward through that optimizing and then analyzing how the algorithm would have performed in an out of sample data period. And I know that that gets a little confusing, but basically what walk forward is, is what it sounds like it's doing. You're basically optimizing for a certain period. So I'll just use an example of 2000 till 2005. You'll optimize to see what the most optimal stop was. Let's say it picked 400. Then it'll analyze uh, if we went from 01 to oh, what I say, 04, 05 in the, in the, in the back test, then it'll walk forward another maybe a year and see how it would have done in 06 with those numbers. And then once 06 is done, it'll re-optimize now including 01, 02, 03, 04, 05, and then 06, and then walk forward in 07. And then it'll include 07 and walk forward in 08. And it'll keep doing that until you have some kind of a report that says, and, and every time it re-optimizes, it's potentially changing the inputs. The, the good thing about walk forward is it's going to give you a more pessimistic view of the algorithm's potential. So the back test is going to be the most optimistic, where the walk forward will be uh, more pessimistic. And so it won't be necessarily the best, but it'll give you a more realistic view. And sometimes an algo will make it through the optimization, the back test, and then fail in the walk forward. And, and there's, plus or, there's pass and fail uh, criteria that I use for the walk forward. As you can imagine, there's a lot of different ways that you can do the walk forward. You could... How many years back do you go in the for the in sample period? How long do you walk forward for the out of sample? Um, do you use an anchored walk forward where uh, you're always including um, the earlier years, or do you allow the walk forward window to kind of shift with the data so that you're not really looking at the the older years? There's a lot of ways to do that, and I'm I'm sure there's a ton of opinions. I have my own way. Basically, what I do is I just use a matrix, and I and I have pass fail criteria where I want it to be within a certain degree of what the optimization was or what the back test was, and as long as it's within the back test expectations plus or minus um, uh, a certain window, then then I'll consider the walk forward to be a passing test. Um, so at that point. Once walk forward is done, and assuming the algorithm passes, then you in essence have an algorithm that you're ready to take live and see how it does in live trades. Uh, but before you do that, I mean, so this is where uh, there's also going to be a lot of different opinions on this. For me, I trade uh, collections of algorithms. So, so the algorithm that 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 we're looking at here, this trading algorithm. Remember, I I, I distinguish between a trading algorithm and a trading system. All we've done so far is just a trading algorithm. So the, all that work might have been for momentum A. Well, then I go through it again with momentum B algorithm and then mean reversion A algorithm. Once that's all done, there's a whole nother design sequence that I go through that I'm gonna be talking about in another video. And um, But in essence, 
what we're doing is creating an individual algorithm that could be traded in the market and a lot of people do i'm assuming the majority do actually just take an algorithm put it in the market and don't really do the a similar analysis on a system of algorithms but um, for me for my style of trading this is just sort of the first step and so um, i hope that th this video is helpful i know there's a lot a lot to this especially if you're new to to trading algorithm um, design or, or even using them but hopefully this is helpful to give you an idea of what goes into an algorithm and and of course you know why in my opinion algo trading is is more um, is superior to discretionary trading now again there's discretionary traders that have done well and I, I don't want to bash that necessarily because I know there's a lot that, that do well and are profitable but for my um, just my personality I'm definitely much more of a quantitative trader because really the, re the reason why is simple. The, um, the back test gives you an idea of the potential so that when you go live, you have an idea of what to expect. And if you have a few losses, you don't panic and just shut down the algo, but you can look at the back test and see, is it still within those, those ex expectations? I also like the walk forward analysis um, because that, that gives you an idea and it can give you confidence in the algo. And then, of course, I like how in algo trading, everything is defined. You, you can't just sort of create a, a cloud and say, well, somewhere in here is where you put your stop. Everything is tested. Everything is analyzed. And you can quickly change things. You can say, well, what if I use a instead of a, a stop market order? What if I use a trailing stop of some kind? Then it's pretty easy to do that analysis as opposed to looking at a chart and trying to figure out if it'll work, only to realize that uh, maybe it works in a bullish market sequence, but not in a bearish. Okay, so now what I'd like to do as I close out this uh, this video sequence is just talk about the best practices for trading algorithm development. These are just some some things that I've picked up on over the years that I, I hope will be helpful to you. Uh, if any of you are developers, some of this will will probably sound familiar and maybe there might be some new stuff in here you haven't really thought of yet but at any rate let me just go over some of these so number one the fewer technical indicators used the better uh, typically and, and this can really depend on the algo and the developer but my experience is if you have more than three indicators it's probably not going to do well in the walk forward analysis but of course, it, it could really depend on a few different things. But generally speaking, the fewer the number of indicators, the better. The reason why is pretty simple, I think, um, for, at least for me to explain, hopefully. If, if you think of a, an algo that might be very basic where you just buy on a down day. So you have a red day on the S&P, then you buy and you get out the next day. Suppose that algorithm did really good and was profitable. 80% win rate and averaged, uh, whatever, $500 per trade on a 10K account. That would be a great algo and there'd be no need to add another indicator. In fact, adding more indicators would just be taking an otherwise good algorithm and making it over optimized and probably destroying its performance. So that's that's why I think fewer technical indicators is better. And that's that's sort of counterintuitive. I, I realize that on a marketing level, everyone would love to say they've got a thousand indicators or some new crazy indicator that no one's ever thought of. But um, for me, I'm always skeptical of those kind of algorithms when I code them. When I when I start feeling that tug to add a fourth one or even a third one um, or even a second one in some cases where we already have a good a good system or a good trading strategy. All right, the other another one is to modify your inputs by plus or minus ten percent. So what I mean by that is once the optimization is complete, I like to modify the inputs by plus or minus ten percent to ensure that the algo holds up. So. Let's say it picks a stop of $1,000, then I'll check $900 and then $1,100 just to make sure that the, the profit factor doesn't totally get destroyed. It, it should hold up and, and make sense that, uh, that, that whether the stop is 1000 or 900 or 1100 shouldn't make a huge difference, generally speaking. All right, so the third, the third best practice is to back test as far back as possible. The reason why is you want to, it's probably obvious, but you want to test through bull and bear markets. The more data, the better. But I have it here because there, there can be a temptation for someone to only back test through periods that are favorable to the algorithm. So suppose you have a momentum long algorithm, uh, then and maybe you only back test it beginning in 2009. And so you skip 07 and 08 where the market was in a, a pretty rough bear market. 
And you might even rationalize that, well, I'm only going to trade the algorithm when we're in a bull market. But the problem is you don't know you're in the bull market until it's already happened. And so you really need to back test as far back as you can and be honest about what you're doing with, with the code. Uh, walk forward testing is another thing that I'll do. I, I, I talked about that a little bit already, but but basically it gives you the more pessimistic view and, and it'll also help guide. I, I didn't really mention this uh, before because I don't, uh, I don't re-optimize in this way. But generally speaking, if you have an algorithm that you do want to re-optimize every month or every six months or every year or every five years, the walk forward can help tell you when a good time to re-optimize might be. I personally don't do that because I don't. I prefer to not re-optimize because I, I, I feel like uh, that it should only be done very carefully, and very, especially if you have an algorithm that's doing well. Um, in other words, if, if you've got an algorithm that's profitable and doing amazing, you don't want to re-optimize it and change a stop from 1000 to $600 just because uh, that would have made the algorithm a little bit better. In my opinion, you stick with what's working and, and the bar has to be pretty high to change anything on an algo. Okay, this should be incredibly obvious, but you want to include slippage in commission. Uh, be realistic about the expectations of slippage. Again, if it's a day trade algo that's in and out, in and out, you might have a, uh, and I'll talk about this on six, but you might have a really low average gain per trade. So you might rationalize, well, I'll, I'll have pretty good fills though. And so you might only use one tick of slippage as opposed to two if there's two market orders. And by just increasing the slippage one tick, it can really destroy some day trade algorithms. It really depends on, on a lot of factors, but, but you want to include it and you want to be realistic about it. Pay attention to average game per trade. Of, of, all, the, uh, of all the metrics in the back test, this is one of the top ones in my opinion, because it, it really helps give you an idea of how much margin for error there is, in particular on the fills. Because if you have a successful algorithm like we have, the, the slippage becomes an issue. And so the higher the average game per trade is, the more margin you have for that. And by the way, that's why we trade the S&P and the 10 year only is because it can handle the volume that we do. Uh, so then when you optimize, number seven, optimize with broad strokes. You don't wanna over optimize by checking every possible interval. So uh, what I mean by that is, let's say you have a moving average. You could, uh, you could optimize the moving average for a two day, three day, four day, five day, six day, all the way up to a hundred day. And you could run that a hundred optimizations that would loop through a hundred times checking every one. That's very granular though. And, and you might find that, that it might find some amazing number, some weird number like 57 days where it tends to do really well, but 56 and 58 don't do well. But then if you go down to a 30 day, you have kind of between 20 day and um, or I'll, I'll do like a b between 10 day and 15 day or 20 day it does really well so that's that's why the the broader strokes the better and that'll also help you get through the walk forward analysis if it's really granular then then it can my my experience is that the algorithms can struggle a bit more um, profit factor between 1.25 and 2.2 is ideal now this this is probably controversial i, I would think but what I mean by that is um, certainly you want to have a profit factor above, you know, 1.2. Um, I have 2.5 here, but really 1.2 is might be a better number. Anything below 1.2 probably isn't going to be good enough. A lot of people will say you want 1.3 or better. I'm a little bit more, um, uh, uh, you could say, generous, I guess, towards that because I'm so I'm so hesitant to to trade something that's above 2.2. So why do I have a 2.2 there as well? So um, the reason why is because if you have an algorithm that has a profit factor of, um, let's say 3.7, that algorithm is very close to a holy grail in my opinion. There's probably a few number of trades or there's, there's something else in there that's just not realistic. Now, if someone does have an algorithm that that's good and, and is traded live and, and has been consistent in that level, then hats off to you. And I, I believe, I guess it's possible that they exist. So I don't want to be too skeptical about that. But my experience is that anything above 2.2, um, you know, there's some gray area there, 2.5, maybe that's fine. But certainly anything above three, uh, you should be very cautious about because it's probably over-optimized. And, and I, I think that's just, or, or there's not enough trades. There's something there that just isn't adding up. Um, so, 
I, I like to see something like 1.5 is really good. Um, 2.0 is, is really good as long as it meets the other criteria. 1.3 is even really good, especially if it has a large number of trades because it'll, in fact, our um, some of our momentum ES algos are in that level. But they trade almost every day and so they're the, so it makes it worth it in the long run. Um, okay, more than 200 trades in the back test. That is, uh, you know, the more trades, the better. If you only have 50 trades in the back test, then be skeptical of anything in it. And if it has five trades, be incredibly skeptical. This can be hard though, if, if especially if it has a long hold time. If it's a swing trade ES algo that holds for, um, that trades on a weekly chart, you're probably not gonna have that many trades in it. It's probably gonna get in and hold for a very long time. The other reason why that's good though is because you have to think of your emotions as well. Let, let's say it can hold for a year and it currently is in a trade when you design it. What are you going to do? Are you going to get into it when it's already up a ton um, only to see a, a massive stop out? So the more higher frequency or the, the, the more often you trade, the better as well, in, in my opinion. Um, now, that's within reason. Though. I, I, I personally am not a big fan of a lot of the day trade algos that are in and out multiple times. Um, and on the product... Uh, the product videos, I probably talk a little bit about that. But uh, generally speaking, though, for me, 200 trades in the back test at least. Um, ideally, you'd have about a thousand. Okay, this is getting a little more technical, but you want to make sure that you have some kind of look in sidebar enabled. On TradeStation, that, it's actually called look in sidebar. This is something that if you're new to quantitative trading, uh, can, can end up biting you and you don't realize it's a thing until probably after it happens. Really, all that refers to is when the backtest analyzes a trade, it'll look at a candle, and the candle will have an open, a close, a high, and a low. Well, in the backtest, in the optimization, it won't necessarily look at every uh, kind of trade within that candle. And so, suppose you have an algo that has a tight stop and a tight target, and it gets in and out multiple times during the day or, or multiple times on a chart. Um, you, you can run into a problem where in one candle, it might have hit the limit first or the stop first, and you really don't know. Um, so in other words, when it's analyzing it, it runs into a candle, and it assumes you are in the trade, and, and you have a limit, and you have a stop, the limit of $100 and a stop of $100, but the swing on that candle is maybe $500 up and down. So, so it really has no way of knowing if it hit the limit first or the stop first. And that can really affect the performance of the algorithm. So what TradeStation does and some of the other developer, uh, some of the other platforms is they have a their own little algorithm that looks at the open, close, high and low and tries to do a best guess of which one would have been hit first. But um, so, you, so that's what it'll typically do. If you have look inside enabled, it'll take longer to run through the optimization but it'll look at a candle within a candle. So if you have a 60 minute candle, you can set it up to look at one minute candles within that 60 minutes. So it'll actually know if the stop was hit first or the limit was hit first. So just make sure that that is enabled. If you have really large stops and large limits and you're trading on, uh, on, on smaller candles actually, then it's probably not going to be as big of an issue. It might occur maybe uh, five times in, in a thousand trades. And that's sort of the case with my algos. So it's, it's not as important on some, but to be accurate, you do want that enabled. 11, you want to trade highly liquid markets. Prepare for growth. You should um, assume that the algo will be success and that liquidity will be an issue. Uh, this is something that bit me early on with the NASDAQ algos. Uh, we they just aren't really that liquid. Uh, I mean, they're liquid. You can get in and out, but they can't really handle the volume that that my program runs. And then, of course, you want to test the algo in live markets. So you want to ensure there's there's nothing hidden there. Uh, and a lot of times, this could be something that works in the uh, in the sim account when you're doing the back test, but not in live trades. Um, an example of that would be there's there's some end of day variables that are used in TradeStation that work in SIM but not in live accounts. Um, another one that could be an issue is especially if you're using a, some kind of a trailing stop where you might adjust that multiple times in a day. Maybe it's on a minute candle and every minute you're adjusting it. Well, that can throw out a lot of red flags for the broker because they'll see a whole bunch of trades in the in an hour they might see 60 trades where that's being moved 
And so that can be an issue as well. So those are just little things though, but um, testing it in the live market before you, you put a lot of capital into it is also a, a good idea. Those are kind of the main best practices that I use. I'm sure there's others, and I'm sure that some of these might not apply to everyone. Um, they are These best practices are pretty specific towards my style of trading. Um, but uh, yeah, hopefully this was helpful though, and maybe there's some in here that, that you think are helpful. By the way, if you're watching this and you have some of your own, I would love to hear from you. I, I'm I'm very uh, I'm I'm always looking to 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 hear from other developers and, and see what other ideas they have that I might not have been thinking about. The the reality is that as an algo trader, as any trader, um, if if you're overconfident, that's usually when you get kind of bit. So I've learned over the course of the years to just be uh, very very humble and realistic about what we're doing and realize that there probably is better ways to do things. But what we're doing right now has, has worked for, uh, for us. And, um, and we've, we've had a great run. So I look forward to kind of showing you some more videos when I look at the trading system methodology that I use. In other words, how I put together a system. So with that, I'll close it out. Thank you so much for watching. Hopefully this was helpful. Again, uh, you can visit us on algorithmictrading.net. Remember that trading futures involves substantial risk of loss. It's not appropriate for everyone. Um, and also keep in mind, you know, I'm not a CTA. We're a third-party developer, so we can't give advice. And finally, uh, this, this video is on trading algorithm design. Again, the individual algorithm that's within a system. I'm going to be doing another video, and, uh, and it'll be on trading system design. So how do I assemble these algorithms into one complete system. That's kind of the second part to all this. The first part is sort of the longest just because of all the steps involved between optimization, backtest, uh, walk forward, live trade, all the best practices. The next video on system design will be, should be a little bit shorter, uh, but is, is really the second part of this and, and I think is the other big reason why we've been so successful. So with that, I hope you have a great day and thanks for watching.